For this lesson, I want to return to Jean Joing and our basic standing posture. And you do have to give these things a go, otherwise there's no point carrying on with the new exercises that I'm giving you. You've got to give it a try and you've got to try and get some progress in that, start integrating it into your training in the way that I've, that I've explained in, in previous videos. So if we begin with our, with our basic posture, today I'm going to solve a different puzzle. Present and solve a different puzzle. And this is one of the original visualization exercises that was used by Wang Shenzhai himself, as reported by Wang Demo. And it's quite a simple exercise. And the idea is to visualize that someone's pouring a ladles of really warm water over your head, you know, like a great big spoon. And they pour in over your head and the warm water is falling down all over your body. So first visualize that. And the idea with this is that you are going to bring your intention into all of your muscles one by one. So remember we talked about this idea of kind of feeling the muscles one by one, putting our intention in different parts of the body and changing it, changing it from the shoulders to the elbows to the wrists. And I said, we can think of it as like a little bit of a scanning exercise, like you scan, like in a science fiction movie, you scan, they scan the ship section by section. We're scanning our whole body, and it's a bit like that. And that's not the, the sound that you should be hearing in your head. So imagine the, the warm water being poured on the top of your head and it slowly just drips down. It's like trickle down intention. Hope it's more successful than trickle down economics have been in the UK, I have to say. Trickle down intention. Feel that water. And it's really warm and it's really lovely. And feel it go all the way down, down your trunk, down your thighs, your knees, and then into the feet and then another. It's, kind of, it's very relaxing in and of itself, but You've really got to engage, like, like, like for a minute you don't feel anything, like the visualisation doesn't connect with the feeling. This is a very different kind of, when we talked about like the, the point between muscle engagement and visualisation, the muscle engagement and visualisation have got to be brought together to create effects like kind of feeling like you're holding a ball or something like that. And this is different. There's, well, it feels like there's almost no muscle engagement. And one of the things that's interesting here is, I've talked about before, you know, you can lie down and visualize movement and, and feel it, like you can feel that you're doing it. And not just like, it, it begins to challenge the idea of mind because you can feel it in your, like you feel in your whole body. So if I imagine doing something like this kind of movement, I imagine it, like I can feel it in my ass, but I don't think really any kind of, I don't think there's any, bodily stimulus whatsoever, nothing's being triggered or anything like that. I think that is entirely in my mind. But remember, I talked about this idea that actually we haven't got the scientific wherewithal. Wang Shenzhai didn't, and most of us haven't to actually know that. So we're just kind of postulating the possibility that that's just entirely in your mind. And a very similar phenomenon to people having the same body when they dream. And that body be having either the same limitations or very similar limitations. Sometimes you can do something extraordinary in your dream, like fly or do the splits if you can't do the splits or something, but you have a physical body in, in your dreams and, it, and it's affected by the same kind of physical laws because it's a social construction of having that body and how it works. How powerful that is, how ingrained that is. You know, you don't dream about usually having a completely different kind of physical form. So this is one of those exercises where it's very much, if this is muscles and this is visualization, it's very much visualization rather than rather than muscles, just feeling that. Feeling the hot water, lovely hot water, it's just hot enough to be to be just how you like it.
And the reason we want that kind of a, a ladle being poured, like you can think about just for relaxation or for health, you can think about visualise like a warm shower. Just, and that's really, really relaxing visualisation as well. We know how powerful these are now for mental health, for general well-being, for relaxation. It's absolutely mainstream now. You can visualise a shower, but that gives you like a whole body feeling of well-being, which is good for the kind of health aspects. But we want something different for the, for the martial arts aspects. We want to start being able to feel different parts of our body and feel shifting our intention, scanning our intention through our body, giving the intent this ability to do this. What's up? Wait, what's up? Is it tea time? Come on, let's get me tea. If you were a dog, you'd visualise eating food and the food going through your body and filling your tummy up and then more food and, you know, if you were a dog. So we visualise this hot water just pouring down. And that's incredibly simple puzzle to set. Well, that's not an easy one to solve, as in actually getting that feeling and working with that feeling. And as each ladle full of hot water is poured over your head just try and feel yourself relax with it as it passes over each part of your body feel that part of your body relax and that's how you use this visualization actually really try to tell that part of the body to relax that's an important concept so the the most obvious thing that i use it for is flexibility training when people are doing flexibility and how poor people's flexibility is, is just a testament to the physical ideologies that people have been enslaved in to limit their ability to use their bodies. I envision a world where everyone is a washu master. Imagine controlling that world with whatever agenda. And when people are stretching and their the muscles are really tight, I say like, actually tell the muscle to relax, use your mind to tell the muscle to relax, tell it to relax, focus on the muscle, feel the muscle, tell it to relax with your mind. And people find it very hard to believe that there is that link between intent and that part of the body that they think. I don't know what it is people think controls it. I know what affects it, just living in society generally in the way that we live, but telling your, most people anyway, telling your mind, telling your leg, telling your muscle to relax, relax, relax the muscle, eventually the muscle gives like that and just using that is really useful. But a very similar effect here, as you imagine the hot water just going to different, so if I imagine my hot water going to, to the shoulders, just feel your body relax with it. Let go of the tension. Remember that idea of like, relaxing the muscles around here, like you want to pee, but you don't pee. And you do, I suddenly feel how much tension is there. Unscrunching the bum muscles, unscrunching the, the muscles here around the knee, feel them go like that, so the water hits them. It's a really good visualization for quite, quite early on when you start standing, like, like if you're gonna do like half an hour or something like that. In the first five minutes, just visualising this, just helping you to relax a little bit more, getting rid of that tension. I mean, there's no question, it's, it's partly an endurance exercise and Yao Zong Zong talks about, you know, you do have to build up the ability to do it, that's partly muscular. But there's also no doubt that as, as the muscles are under tension, they start to, you know, like they, they, they're using so much unnecessary tension that it tires it out too quickly it tires the muscles out too quickly it starts creating cramps and things like that so learning to relax at the same time as you're building up your endurance which you do holistically as i said before you don't as yours on says just do as long as you can and then just a tiny little bit more just a tiny little bit more 
and relax and relax and then go back and then go back relax use this from Chen Tai Chi really useful also from Chen Tai Chi <laughs> just relax off that and don't worry as I say set yourself half an hour at this stage now we should be working up to setting ourselves half an hour you don't have to hold the posture for half an hour don't fetishize volume it's not an endurance exercise it's not it's not Guantanamo Bay putting people in stress positions you know like it's not supposed to be a form of torture or interrogation technique it's holistic just build it holistically relax just relax feel that hot water I want to just stand in now, but I can't, so I've got too, got too much else to talk about. So that's a really good exercise. Now I'm going to do, practice that one. I won't, I won't labour going on about it. Then when you've relaxed a bit with it, oh, relax, relax, relax. You will believe me, you'll get through the, the torture, feeling like it's torture. Don't even go to the torture phase. Just do it so that you can just do what's comfortable for you. Build it up over half an hour. Do what you can do, relax off, and you know, have a little bit of a, and then come back, come back like that. And it'll build, just build organically like that. You can just totally bypass that. And don't, don't even listen to those people who talk about how hard and terrible their training was and they really fetishize and celebrate torturing your body. That couldn't be any more opposite to what Wang Chen Jai was talking about. And then when you've got that, we want to use or you can use a different, a little bit abstract visualization, which again is one of the, the key visualizations that was used by Wang Shang Jai. And this is the idea of listening to soft, distant rain. And it's not like it's very figurative. It's not really about the idea of you don't you don't achieve success. You don't solve this puzzle by eventually convincing yourself that you can hear soft, distant rain is to do with the way that you're engaging with the sounds around you. That you're just kind of taking everything, just like you're staring into the distance, uh, maybe at a mountain in the distance. You can close your eyes as well, it doesn't matter. But I think it's better for your martial intent, usually not to do that. It's better to have like a of your intent focus like this in the distance. At first, we'll, we'll talk about expanding the idea of intent. It's something Li Jian Yu talks about and also Yu Yong Yan talks about this idea, your intent expanding into the room. And that's given rise to some false ideas around magic powers and extending your ability to move things. And, Those people can they can never they can never do it to extend to move anything like when anyone's watching. So but that idea of staring into the distance, now listening into the distance and letting all the sounds around you. Letting all the sounds around you just kind of go to that place, just like just like when you're staring into the distance and you just start letting, you keep focused, but you let all the light go fuzzy and it all starts getting a bit. Like your eyes start working in a different way and you start seeing patterns in the light. Everyone sees that, right? <laughs> Everyone sees that. Everyone who sees, sees that. After a bit. And you just let that happen and you don't, like you start, your mind starts focusing on things in a very different way in a, in, um, and you don't want to fight that, you just want to go with it. I mean, I'm trying to explain something that's experiential, but I think everyone's experienced that at some point. If you just kind of relax and stare into the distance, you start seeing weird patterns in things, your mind starts perceiving things in different ways. Just go with that, just relax with that. And the same thing with your hearing. Just let all the sounds become kind of distant like that. It's almost like you start feeling a little bit of a, not an unpleasant pressure, but some, like a kind of pressure around here. 
because by focusing on sound now, you're also focusing your intent much more directly in this area, so you actually start feeling it. So I'm a little bit abstract, but this is to create the right feeling of relaxation. So first of all, for just health and well-being, the kind of thing everyone's doing now, like visualisation, meditation, kind of like mindfulness, but I think a lot more sophisticated. And that's to create then, to, if we want to go on to the martial stage, the martial art stage, to create the right level of relaxation, that we can then start playing with these. Forces is a very misleading term, but these experiences in the body, I recall that when we lock, we lock into a particular lock, but it's relaxed. And the more relaxed we are, the stronger the feeling of the lock. That's the contradiction we try to play with and develop. So listen, listen to the sounds. And Wang Shin Jai student Wang Demo talks about it's useful at first just to like be in a nice quiet place to do this um, but later on you should be able to do it in noisier places you should be able to even like in a crowd or something like that even though someone's going to call the police if you do that and there's a video of someone who's been standing for a very long time in russia um i think it was a couple of hours or something like that and security guard is like what are you doing you're a drug addict or something like that it's quite just just standing still. I mean, someone commented, just standing still just messes with people, my, people's minds. And um, certainly, like, like me, and when I'm training in the gym, how many times, like, I've seen a student on the back and I'll just stand like that, I'll just stand behind like that. And how much that affects people, like, just the fact that you're doing that is unbelievable. It just in and of itself, it's like the... It's like each one's like the virus of revolution against physical ideologies. You stand in the middle of the gym where everyone's doing all this weight training and torturing their bodies and so focused on. I always say like all that weight training and stuff like that. But like like muscle men, you know, I'm not saying I'm not saying it's wrong to do that by any means, but I'm saying like for for young men who are just kind of doing it because they feel like body you know the pressure to look a certain way spending so much time in the gym trying to become bigger than themselves whereas wushu is about becoming part of something bigger than yourself i love that difference <laughs> you do this in the gym and the way it's just like a virus that just starts disrupting people disrupting our people it's just things that are just out of the ordinary just just doing this in the gym just but I quite like doing it in the gym, I find a place in the gym. So the kind of fetishization of being out in the in nature, in the woods and things like that. You don't have to think of it like that, you can do standing where, where it's best for you. And it can be, it's like flexibility is highly social, so that people who are quite flexible can feel very like, oh, I'm not very flexible today, but as soon as it becomes like people are watching them, becomes a spectator thing, or someone else is quite flexible, all of a sudden you find that you are more flexible when people are watching you. Similarly, very often people find that if you're in a group, you can stand longer, or if people are watching you, you feel more comfortable for longer standing. I remember my coach saying the energy is higher in a, in a group. I think that's a little bit of a misleading way of putting it, but I think there's like, like the spirit and, and I think that's what he meant anyway, you know, like, because um, his English wasn't brilliant. The, the the spirit of the group, you know, is higher than one person on their own for standing. So anyway, we're listening to the, what a standing waffle. We're listening to the sound of distant rain. It's a metaphor for just the way you're listening to the sounds around you. It's almost like you are listening for like somewhere out there, behind all of that noise, is the sound of light rain, and you're just listening for it through everything. Tuning out everything else and just listening to that. It's a lovely exercise, really relaxing exercise as well. But now I want to do another one.
that's really interesting and this is going to tell us something about maybe maybe it's going to tell us something about the idea of well let's see let's see where we get you'll understand what i'm talking about when we get there so let's say we've done those exercises we're quite relaxed now and we're going to just focusing on our breathing And we have this interesting thing like that the breathing should be natural, but that doesn't mean the same as our ordinary breathing. And Yao Song Zun says, like, as you're standing, you go along, you, your breathing becomes deeper. And it's still natural, you're not trying to force it in any way. You might even get a few. And try doing that, by the way, because I can really feel that in my arms when I do that. Like, I feel that pulse out in my arms when I do that. And I'm just assuming that's the muscles from my chest just going like that. And then when they come in, it just has a little bit of a, re a reverberation effect around the rest of the muscles. Just natural breathing. Just natural breathing. Oh, here's another point, by the way. When you when you're doing this, don't lean forward on your on your toes like that. I don't think I talked about this before, but when Wang Shangjai was started going deep into this, experimenting with this, he always thought like you should do it on your toes, like just leaning forward, so that your weight is on your toes and you're leaning forward. And he started to get like pains in his chest, so. He just he adjusted his posture back, back like that. I'm not sure why you would get pains or uncomfortable feelings in your chest, but maybe if you're doing it to the degree that he was doing it, like some other level, of course, some other level happens, doesn't it? But he adjusted it back to being on his heels instead, so you should be on your heels like that. One of the interesting things that this tells us is that this method was not handed down in some kind of pure, complete form by Guo Yunshen to Wang Shen Zhai. Like it can't have been. Such a basic thing that, I mean, maybe he was taught to do it like that on you, but he doesn't say that. He just, he, he says something like he always felt like he should do it on his toes and he moves, but it doesn't say he was taught like that, but he shifts back onto his heels like that. And even if he was taught like that, it shows you that, you know, no matter who taught you it, it can be modified. So shifting back on the heels. We don't want to do, keep doing deep sighs like that, do enough of them just going about day in their life. But our breathing does get deeper, so it's a very interesting idea that what, what counts as natural breathing changes. Just like it does when we're, you know, when we're sparring or something like that and the breathing changes. Your mouth should be slightly open. Feel, feel like you're breathing through your nose and out through your mouth, but it's more like breathing out through your mouth than your nose. Now as the breathing gets, focus on the breathing. We're doing an ancient, we're doing an ancient visualisation now. As you breathe in, imagine like the breath going into your body and then becoming part of your body, like it's transforming into like particles or something that just breaks up and dissipates. And even as you're breathing out, you feel it traveling through your body. So you breathe in, you feel it going in, you visualize it going out to every extremity and part of the body. You know, and even as you're breathing out, it continues going on outwards. Visualize it.
visualise it till you start getting little ting tingly sensations and quite sensual sensations going around the body. Because you're feeling your body. You're feeling your body. When we say like sensual, it doesn't have to mean like sexual. It's just that we live in societies that make our bodies 90% dead and they only spring to life again. We only start feeling them under certain situations like pain or like when a lover touches us or something that brings our attention or when a dog does a flying surprise nut shot to see if you're ready. Because <laughs> you've always got to be ready. That's the rule in our house, isn't it? Always be ready. So it's actually nothing to do necessarily with sexuality. It's just that sexuality is just one of those situations where you're permitted to feel your body again in a way that you normally normally don't. So it's just about physical sensation and being connected to your body. So feel this thing, this force, these particles, these things. I visualize these little particles going around the body. Visualize the air going into your lungs and there's a feeling of course like because the, the, the way the tummy is affecting breathing that it's going deep deeper than your lungs into your into your tummy and then just going everywhere from there and this is a key idea for the washu masters of the past and what this is doing of course is it's visualizing something like chi this is I'm not saying this is the idea of chi, but what I, what I will say is that this is what the Wushu masters of old did, that they understood that there's a link between intent and physical body that had been severed, and they looked for ways to reconnect that link. Just in exactly the same way as each one uses visualizations, they use this idea. It is a visualization, the idea of breathing in. Remember chi, she doesn't translate as energy or anything like that. She literally translates as gas, but idiomatically within Chinese medicine and the Wushu world, it's related to breath, breathing in, and it's connected to then to something that, that, that passes through the body. Because it's such a variable concept, it changes from person to person. And I think what people very often don't get, as I've talked about before, that this is actually a really good thing in Wushu culture, that the same idea has multiple different meanings depending on your level of sophistication of thought and achievement. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna rehearse the idea, I've talked about it before, about how the lower level is the most complex and the highest level is the simplest, but it's got the most profound implications. It's like a lighthouse light. People are like, oh, that's too simple, it can't be that. It must be this thing down here, some mystical, magical force that scientists can't detect, but nevertheless, it's there in the body and it goes through all these meridians and all these different names and into a dantian and things like that. Here, right at the top of the lighthouse, none of those considerations even matter. Here in the middle, you've got people arguing, is chi a superstitious concept, is it? Or is it like this mystical force and all that? We want to go past all of that. We want to transcend all of that. So when people say, Wang Shanjai didn't believe in chi, he was still using the idea of chi in his 70s. He just saw it on a much more sophisticated level. What the ancients of Washu understood is that you use visualization to reconnect this link. And this is the one of the easiest ways to do it. Just, I'm not saying that they didn't really believe in chi. I mean, they did, but it doesn't matter whether they believe it's real or not. It's the Thomas theorem. It's, it's real if it's real in its effects. So you feel it. And you feel it go throughout your whole body. And it's real and it's effects in other ways as well. Like for linking the intent into the body. Like, like when someone hits you and you visualise your chi resisting it. Or when you're ill and you say, my chi will, you know, I'll always say, my chi will resist it. I, like I, I neither believe or disbelieve that. I think it's something far more complex as what. Wang Shanjai student Hansi Huang called 
virtual reality, the power of virtual reality. It's existing in another kind of paradigm where it doesn't have to be real. It just has to stimulate certain kinds of effects. It can't stop me getting knocked out and it can't stop me getting COVID. I know that. I know that. It's about the insulin. It's about will. The will to, you know, you're in the middle of a fight or something like that or um, these exercises where I swing the punch bag and hit the punch bag and release force on the punch bag and just visualising chi aids the movement. Just visualising chi aids my my will to be healthy. You know, that's a really important idea. It's used now quite a lot in, in Western medical science as well. You know, people just give up. So it becomes real, real in its effects. And of course, this sense of bre deep breathing is like breathing down into the... You start imagining there's something there. So that's like the Dantian. doesn't matter whether it's real or not real. You know, there isn't an organ there. These people are obsessed with the idea that somehow there's this magical thing that's real, that must be there. You must believe that it's literally real. And everyone else is ignorant and stupid and if they don't believe it. I'm not mocking them, what I'm saying is there's an idea that's far more sophisticated than that. The kind of thing that... What is it, love? What is it that you're trying to do? It's real if it's real in its effects. Are you missing a toy or something? What is it? Is it that? Well, I don't want to play with it, even if you found it. It's real if it's real in its effects. And this is what the Yichuan Revolution did. It realised that there's this, that they'd done this, that they'd recognised this link between intent and the physical body and used this concept as a kind of visualisation. But it was very often used in different ways. So it was used in harmony with more complex forms of breathing. So people would be doing like, you know, in and out, or you know, you breathe this way when you go this way, you breathe out when you go that way. So what happened in each run, of course, is then they start taking it from that and they start bringing it more deeply into the idea of this becomes more important, standing, becomes more important than, for example, in, in Tai Chi Chuan practicing the guiding force movements. And that being very incorporated with breathing. And that becomes codified over time, it becomes mystified. And all of a sudden, again, this whole process of like you didn't, maybe your teacher himself or herself didn't even understand how they achieved the level they did. And they helped to codify it and pass down a false way of thinking about what's actually going on. Just the idea of visualisation is enough to explain all of this idea around movement and breathing and chi and dantians, that it works in that sense of re-interlinking the intent and the body. And particularly for these kind of movements, visualising the chi moving around the body. It's just a way, it's just like those, those video capture things where they put little put little balls on a suit like that, you know, and then they film an actor doing something and then they can create a CGI. It's imagining those things all over your body and what is chi. It's chi going all through your body. And that helps you to helps you to visualise, maybe not the camera, but you know helps you to visualise your all of your kind of Tai Chi moves or whatever it is that you're that you're doing helps it, aids the process, it's a visualisation. But of course, when you start bringing it into standing and emphasising standing, then you can't have this thing where, well, when you do this, you breathe in, and when you do that, you breathe out, because you're just standing. So all of that's got to go out the window anyway. So you could start making rules about breathing and start saying, well, breathe in for a count of five, breathe out for a count of five. But all of a sudden you realise how completely artificial that is. It's just in the nature of the thing itself and the way that it's going, the way Wang Shenzhai thinks about it, returning back to what's natural, stripping away all the, the stuff that's become overly codified, overly mystified. It's just, everything's just going that way to just say, just breathe naturally. Just breathe naturally. 
And then once you've got that idea, there's no need to bring it back in. Especially when that then gets replaced, that idea gets replaced by visualization, different kinds of visualization that do the same thing, that do the same job. Does it really matter whether you visualize chi going through your whole body or whether you visualize hot water being poured over you? It's doing the same thing, only you can do more visualizations for different things. It becomes much more effective. Like if I imagine someone's pulling my arms or, you know, visualizations like that, or there's bamboo poles and I'm pushing out like that, that's more effective, gets more effects than just imagining that there's chi in my arms, visualizing chi. It's a more sophisticated way, way of thinking about chi. So those people who insist it's a real thing, those people who insist that it's just, just totally bonkers pseudo-scientific concepts, Within the Yichuan paradigm, it's all about contradictions and this absolutely vital concept of virtual reality and the way we think about the relationship between visualization and physical effects in that realm. It's the Thomas theorem. It's what we now call the Thomas theorem, but Wang Shanjai and his senior students were using that idea well before that, that phrase was coined. Something is real, something can be said to be real in a way if it's real in its effects. Isn't that an interesting idea? So I've said before, like, you know, lots of people say chi, the concept of chi has nothing to do with each one, and that really contradicts a lot of things like that, that we know that a lot of that Wang Shenzhai himself used the concept, Yao Zong Zun uses the concept. Wang Demo uses the concept, Li Jian Yu certainly uses the concept. The question is, what do they mean by it? And I've talked before about this idea of thinking about, thinking about agitation in the body, because I always seem to use it in this context of smoothing the chi, smoothing the chi. And we know what we mean by smoothing the blood, the idea that, you know, when, you, when you're stressed and you can feel your pulse, blood pressure, and, that, and that's really important for when you're brought, brought into the stress of a fight or even just like, like you know a job interview or a stressful situation where you're worried and you've got to use breathing to just try and just try and calm yourself down calm that down and i think they mean something like that that when they say smooth the chi something about just agitation in posture and i think you know the kind of thing like like when someone's really really nervous teaching or giving a lecture or something like that and I say I see it myself as someone who gives lectures I see it myself and you know people start pacing like that so the thing is you know and you notice this very agitated movement that they have um, and the movement's very agitated and I think they mean something like that like like no stop doing that smooth the chi just get rid of that agitation in the just breathe keep breathing Get rid of that agitation in the body. Smooth the chi. Give those, give all those visualizations a go. Have a think about the things that I've said, and I'll get back to you with some more later on. Some more, some more specific ones. Okay, that's it for this lesson. One love. Take it easy. I'll see you in the next one. Won't we love? Yes, we will. Good boy. We're good boy.